What's up, everybody? Tucker Mail here, and I am joined in the studio with one of my close friends and partner in the gospel for 10 plus years. Almost 10. Almost 10 years. Faithful servant of our church in a lot of different roles that we'll talk about, but uh, welcome to the studio, Chris Smith. What's up, brother? Nothing much. <laughs> How you doing? Blessed to be here. Yes, blessed to have you. If you don't know Chris, I can give you the introduction that uh, you are currently serving in our, uh, I would say, addiction recovery ministry f- and really focusing on people who are kind of uh, maybe either getting out of jail or getting out of prison and resetting their life. But um, you also are, have been faithful in so many different areas, street evangelism, uh, you do the homeless outreaches, you go into the prisons, you help your wife in Twilight Hope, our uh, elderly care ministry. So you are a man that wears a lot of ministry hats. Really? It's wherever God tells me to go, I go. <laughs> That's right, baby. <laughs> so I invited you in because we have invited our whole church family to join us on April 15th, which is, I guess, a week from Monday. Yes. Uh, to celebrate something that is happening in your life that has been a long time coming and I think um, I think it's gonna be my first time ever uh, inviting the church to celebrate this for anyone in any capacity but uh, you are congratulations you're getting off parole yes dude. congratulations how does it feel dude um you know I've been thinking a lot about that so in Idaho it doesn't change anything yeah um there's a couple doors that'll open up as far as getting into some of the institutions that I have to wait to be off parole. Yep. But the I'm most excited about is be able to take Jesus outside of Idaho. Yes. To be able to travel anytime I want freely without yep. having to get a pass with no restrictions. Yep. So you can go to, uh, you can cross state lines and you can go get a passport. Yes. Cool. So um, we've invited the church to basically uh, a time where we're going to eat. We're going to hear uh, some stories. I'm going to share almost like a, a, a commission for you. So that um, you just you just receive the honor of your faithful commitment to the agreement you made with the parole board of Idaho, but um, in light of that, I thought it might be cool for um, uh, anybody who won't be there at that night or anybody who's thinking about coming to hear a little bit of your story. How did you find yourself on? Uh, how long were you on parole? Well, it was. Um Basically, I've been on parole for over two decades, and then before that, I was on probation and juvenile probation. So um, let, let's just start, you know, maybe at the beginning, and can we get like a 30,000-foot view of how your life turned into, you know, a life that was in the system, Yeah, uh, how you got there, and then, um, man, you got to share how God used your time in prison to actually... Uh, save you and win you into the kingdom and, and use your life in such a amazing way. So let's start at the beginning. Like, All right. t- Tell me how you got into the system. Well, as a young kid, I grew up in a house that was full of violence and full of addiction itself. And so uh, what happened was really when my mom and dad split up, that's when it really got worse for me. Mm. And so I did turn to the streets more and I was in all reality, any kid, you're looking for that love mm. in all the wrong places, that acceptance in all the wrong places. When you say turn to the streets, what does that mean? Like, um, well, I was mostly, um, I was, I believe it or not, I was good at skateboarding. Okay. And um, and I was good at baseball and skateboarding. But as a young kid, there was no skate parks like mm. you see today. Yeah. So um, a defining factor in my life, I was already say, and a lot of my friends were already, you know, their whole families were involved in gangs and all that kind of stuff already. And so I remember a defining factor was um, it was an Albertsons parking lot with thrifties. It had red curbs. Mm. And so they would always tell us to go into the schools. The schools would call the cops and it would always tell us to go to the parking lot. As a lots. skateboarder. As a skateboarder. So I remember that day they were, they, um, were going to take me to jail. And what happened was is they ended up releasing, releasing me to my good friend Peter because he was already 18. And I was actually at the time staying in his garage. So what did you do that made them want you to go to jail? Were you just loitering? Was um, it, like- it was past curfew. Okay. Yeah, it was way past curfew, and I didn't have an adult supervision. And that's the first time you ever had to run in with the law. Oh uh, no. Okay, but <laughs> no. that's that's how you got into. But that was the that was when I made a choice to go the wrong way. Got you. Um, no, w- when it came to skateboarding, we were getting chased daily. So, so how did you jump from you know juvenile delinquent, let's call it skateboarding, you know, just your your typical run in with 
uh, people telling you to get off the property to a life of actually pretty intense crime. Well, really, after that day, I remember telling the cops, if you want to arrest me for something like this, I'll give you a reason to arrest me. Wow. And I kind of went all in for that, you know, and like when I obviously as a juvenile, when I first got arrested, it was more or less like for graffiti and mm. stuff like that. You get got put on juvenile probation. And um, but there was so many things I was still doing that I could have got in trouble for, but didn't. Wow. And so and then as I got into my adult years, I got to a place to where I had so much anger and so much hate in my heart towards family, towards God towards everything because of the stuff I went through as a kid. You know, I was seven years old the first time that I even got a knife pulled on me, mm. you know, by another little seven or eight year old, mm. you know, and that's a whole nother story. But, um, and so really it just escalated to where I was started using a lot of drugs because I was trying to fill that void and take that hurt and pain away. And then also I was, then I started selling drugs and using more drugs to not only supply my habit, but to also make money and then ended up getting involved with gangs. And that's when really, that's when I, I loved guns. Well, <laughs> you know? that's, a, that's a jump, but let's talk about entry point into gangs. Is that, in, is that, I mean, you see it on the movies, you get jumped in, you meet the, the gang boss or what does it mean um, to be involved with a gang? Really in the city I was raised in everybody grew up together. Okay, you know, we all grew up together We played army commander together as kids. We basically, you know, we um, rode played baseball rode skateboards even a lot of us rode skateboards bicycles We did all together. so we kind of grew up together So we were all friends and so in in reality is even before I was technically involved like say jumped into the gang mm. I was still being jumped by other gangs because that's who I associated Got with it so you became a gang member. Yeah. And it, did you have like a a, a a specific job or region where you're selling drugs and really just honest, not, not really to that extent, like really in my, with me, it was just all over my city, mm. you know, where I basically, um, and, and I was using a lot more than I was selling. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. And then really, um, the way our city is set up is you have different streets or different areas yep. of the different gangs and so i never i always went anywhere i wanted it didn't matter mm. you know and so that got me into a lot more problems yeah and so talk about how it escalates you're, you're selling drugs because you're using drugs yeah how do you start having run-ins with actual prison doing time um really that happened um it was a. Uh, um uh, my first gun conviction, I just basically went to the county jail. And then it was just only in the county jail. I got out of the county jail. Um, what happened was is not even 13 days later, I had gave, I had given another individual because he wanted to be from from the gang. I had he and then he was saying that he wanted to go do something mm. to basically to prove his thing. So I talked to another friend of mine, I won't mention names. But I talked to another friend of mine and I says, what do you think? And he's like, let's give him a chance. And I'm like, all right. So I actually handed him a gun and said, go do what you said you're going to do. And I was arrested two hours later. Hmm. And so that ended up being my first prison sentence. And it also, um, they threw an enhancement called criminal gang activity because it's an enhancement that says what you're doing is to benefit organized crime. And so that gave me my first strike. And so how long were you in? And then what kind of, what, what is it like to go to from prison and then try to go back to the normal life or, really, or, or the outside prison life? Not that your life was normal during this time. As crazy as this sounds, when I would get locked up, it was almost like vacation because when you're on the streets and you really don't have stability as somewhere to really go, you're basically running the streets, just going in a way, staying from place to place, wherever you can stay. Mm. And so I would be so like just worn out and just burnt out that when I would get locked up, it would just be like finally vacation. I actually know I'm going to get food. I know mm -hmm. that I have a, in all reality, a safe place to stay and I'm not wandering the streets. And in, in, in prison, did you ever think about, man, changing your life? And, or was it as soon as I get out of here, I'm going right back to what I know. Um, up until I came to Idaho, no, I, there was never a thought my, that was my life. My life was the streets and prison. That was just a revolving door. 
Um, when I came to Idaho, I got on interstate compacted in 2007. What does that mean, You interstate compacted? Um, it means that um, when I paroled, I, put, I, put, I submitted paperwork to transfer my parole from a, to a different state. And why Idaho? Uh, cause my sister and my brother-in-law ended up moving here. My dad ended up moving here. My mom ended up moving here. My aunts and uncles. So you kind of follow them through the prison system. Yeah. It's cause you wanted them to be able to visit or you wanted to just be close to them? No. My last case in California, the city actually exiled me and told me I was no longer to step foot. I couldn't even drive through the city. And so I really had nowhere to go. Mm. I had nowhere to go. And so, um, I started the paperwork, the interstate compact. Okay. So you get to Idaho. In 2007. As a prisoner. Basically as just a parolee. So you get to Idaho as a parolee in 2007. And how did you get yourself back into prison? Well, I knew I knew no other way of life, but I, I knew how to work. I was always good with jobs. So I ended up getting a really good job. And what were you doing? Excavation. Nice. Doing water and sewer mains. And, so, uh, and then I was working at the Mexican restaurant on the weekends. And that was when I was staying in Cunix. That's where I stayed the first six months at my sister's house. Then I got my first apartment in downtown Boise by Jerry's Market, for anybody that knows. Well, it's no longer with us. Yeah, I know. It's not. And it's Jerry's sad. now a coffee shop. Yeah. In apartments, I think. But yeah, 27th Street, Jerry's yeah. Market. Classic so, classic old school. I yeah. guess it's becoming old school. Yeah, so I lived right there. Okay. And, um, and my first apartment ever in my life. And uh, I was doing good, working, paying bills. Are you, are you drinking? Are you doing drugs at all? Drinking or? only. No drugs? No drugs. Okay. And my mom asked me why I was drinking so much, and I justified it. I said, well, I'm not using drugs. Mm. You know, but technically, if you really look at it, it's still a violation of parole. Okay. Because you're not allowed to drink alcohol while you're on parole in Idaho. Okay. And so what ended up happening was two years passes. And you're just drinking and working. and I'm basically working during the week, and then Friday to Sunday, I'm drinking until I pass out, wake up and drink again. What would you have said during that window in that you know, in that time when you're coming to Idaho, you're on parole, but you're, you know, you're just going through the motions. What would you have said if someone had said, come to church with me? Honestly, I did have that invitation and what? I turned, I didn't, I What was your thought interested. process? You just didn't. I just wasn't interested. I was still, I was still mad at God because I blamed God for everything I went through. You believed in God. You just didn't like him. Yes. Okay. You know, and, um, it, but the, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say I truly believed either, because even though, um, like I shared with you a few months ago or last month, um, when I was 19 years old, when I did get off juvenile pro probation at 19, and then I'm not sure how much time passed, but then the marshals came looking for me. And so I ran to another state. And in that other state, I started working under the, under the table at a cabinet shop because that was my first trade I ever learned. And a man approached me and it just so happens that's just that's just how the enemy works though it so happens when i did get to that state i ran into a childhood friend that i've known since kindergarten his his dad was a meth cook where mm. i went to so he was just giving me a lot of drugs mm -hmm. and i was just to use i was using so much that this man approached me and said that i could smell it coming out of your pores he goes you have two choices you can go to this place i know or i can call the cops right now knowing i was on the run I said, where's that place? It ended up being a Christian men's home. So that was my first really, that was my first time ever in that environment. Wow. And, um, and really what happened is I never fully surrendered. I was still living in the world. I was ne still living fully in the world, but living in that place. Mm. So what happened was, is when I did find myself in a situation, which we all know that men, there's the only one that will never let us down is Jesus. Mm. And the men let me down. So I said, see God, I knew you weren't real. Mm. And I blamed God for that too. Mm. So that, so, so, so I guess you could say I believed, but then I said he wasn't real. So that was kind of contradicting that. Yeah. So fast forward, get back to 2007 era. Yeah. You're working and you're on parole. You're violating parole with drinking. And it seems like that's, you know, a collision course for something to give one way yeah. or the other. Either you're going to sober up or you're going to go worse into, you know, what you were, what you were doing in that routine of just wake up and drinking. What happens? So what happens is, is um, I was drinking a lot and then I started going to some like little parties around town with somebody, a couple people that I met started going to parties. And um, this particular night I went to a, I went to a motel party and um, what happened is see growing up, I was taught to hate a certain color and I was taught to hate certain skin colors. Mm. That's just the reality of it. 
Color meaning red, blue, gang yeah. members. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, there was somebody that showed up, both. Mm. You know, and uh, so what ended up happening was is um, I kind of looked at my friend. He kind of looked at me and he kind of gave me the nod and I reacted. And then when I reacted, the guy, the guy actually said something that made me escalate it. And I chose this rival member, this rival yeah. color. Yeah. And I just and I chose and the, and to tell you the truth, now that I think back at it, that. It was it was all because of a color and. That, that was it. That's just that's just how messed up that political lifestyle is. Mm. You know, it was all for nothing. The guy did nothing to me. Mm. You know, he did say something after the fact that made me react and end up using a weapon. But, you know, still, it wasn't OK what happened. You know, it wasn't OK what I did, but I didn't know anything else at that time. So fight breaks out. Everybody scrambles. You're on the run. No. What ended up happening is, I don't know if you want to call it loyalty. I, I believe back then it was more of a loyalty thing, but I believe today it was God working in my life before I realized it. Hmm. Because I remember I told my co-defendant, I says, you know, if they arrest me for this, or if they arrest you for this, I'm going to go turn myself in hmm. because I'm the one who chose to stab the guy. Hmm. And so they arrested him. Hmm. So I, I called my mom and told my mom what I did and told her I'm going to go turn myself in. What'd she say? And I said, I'm never getting out. I'm getting a life sentence no matter what. Because that would have been your third strike. Yeah. If it would have been California. Yeah. So you were ready to do life in prison to be loyal to this guy. Yes. But I also believe it's because I know what it's like to get locked up for something you really have nothing to do with. Mm. You know? And um, and I'm not saying I'm not saying everybody was innocent in that room, yeah. but I'm the one who chose to do what I did. What was that like walking to turn yourself in thinking you're going to get life in prison? I was so drunk that, <laughs> that like, yeah, I drank all night, woke up drunk and kept drinking. Until, you, was it drinking to kind of mask the nerves of turning yourself in? No, it was more or less, you know what? This is the last time I'm going to be able to get drunk like this because I'm <laughs> never getting out. Wow. Wow, so you were committed. You thought you were going to prison for life. Yeah. And tell me what happened. They they you, you they arrest you, you go to court and Um yes, so I go and turn myself in and they thought I was crazy. They told me that they already caught the guy and I said, "You know what? I'll describe the crime to you." And I described it in such detail they read me my rights and handcuffed me. And then um they took me down or they had they had um one of the detectives, the gang detective come and talk to me, take me down to the county jail and I remember um when I got in the cell, when the door closed, that was when it really hit me. Like, why did I just do that? <laughs> like, I'm never getting out, you know, because I really thought I was getting a life sentence no matter what. And my first court date um, was just the arraignment. And then my next court date, they offered me 30 years. Wow. And um, it was a prelim. It was basically uh, 15 years for the aggravated battery and 15 years for the weapons enhancement. Wow. And I was like, yeah, I'm not going to take that one. And then the, my next court date, they offered me 15 years. Wow. And I said, where do I sign? And I did the math. I said, I'm 32. I'll be out when I'm 47. Wow. You know, and so uh, I ended up. Uh, you took the deal. Yeah. I basically took the deal. I did try to get a lesser, a lesser tell. Like the fix wasn't going to change. The way Idaho is different than California. It was, and I didn't understand it even at the time, but I got five fixed, 10 indeterminate. Means you have to serve five before you're eligible parole. And then you have 10 years of parole. And so what ended up happening was I tried to get a five plus five and the DA said, no, you need 10 years to pay off the restitution. Okay. Which it took me six years cool. to pay it off. Um, so now you're, <clears throat> you go to prison in Idaho. Yes. Your life is still, you're still mad at God. Yeah. You're still, you know, um, you not, not sure what, what you're doing in, in like, you know, as far as like what you believe in. Yeah. What changed? What happened? Well, so when I first got into the prison system, it was a, it was a culture shock compared to California. But I adapt. easier prison, harder prison, easier in Idaho. Yeah. Why so? It's sh because in California the politics are way more strict. Okay. And just the way things work is a lot more strict. Okay. Um, and so and then. You know, well, that'll take too long to get into that detail. It's yeah, not that, really important. That, that's a sidebar. But, yeah, but that's just that's just really is. It's a it's a it's a lot different here, and so um. But I adapted because you know you adapt to your environment, mm -hmm. 
And so Did your tattoos get you in trouble? Does anybody recognize what n- those mean? Um, not n- most. Most of them no. Okay. And then um, some of them are some of them some of them I actually some of the fill in stuff I actually got while I was here in Idaho. Okay. Um. So um, and so what ended up happening was is uh, it was right after um, I had a cousin in there, so we became cellies, and then he left to the feds. To, he had to go do a federal violation, so then I ended up selling up with another good friend of mine. Um. And so what ended up happening was is five, six months after that was right after I got my GED, right after I got my GED, not even a couple weeks later that um, we were going to dinner time and um, see they had they had us segregated from, like, say, the rival gangs. Well, this particular time they were walking one of them down the hallway from visiting back to his unit. And um, when I saw that. Um, I chose to react Mm -hmm. and assaulted him and uh, another person actually um, got involved too so it was basically two of us and we ended up they ended up um, ad segging me which is like a type of solitary confinement how long and um, I was in there for three you were just about three years solitary confinement for three years yeah just short of three years but I I I usually just say three years because it was so close so over two years you're in a cell by yourself with very little human interaction yeah it was like 35 months and something so that's why it's close to three years and in that time did you start to reconcile your you know who you you thought God was and who you are or no but I did say this. I remember writing my dad a lot of letters because I've never had that father-son relationship. And I would write him letters and say, you know what? I can't change the past. I know we can't change what happened from the past. Like the things he did to me, the things I did to him, you know. But I just, let's let's let all that go and let's just have a father-son relationship. Let's start new. Yeah. So I was writing him those letters, never hearing nothing back. And then I remember saying, I want to change, but I don't know how. Wow. When the pastors would come to my door and try to talk to me, I wouldn't give them the time or day. I had nothing to say to them except at Christmas time. Because at Christmas time, they brought cookies. And you love cookies. Yes. I know I you love, love cookies. cookies. Still so to this day, Chris loves cookies if anybody wants to bless him on April 15th. When no, we I'm on a intervention. Don't bring cookies. <laughs> He's trying not to eat cookies because he got addicted once he got out of prison. But let's get to that story, no. how you get out. And so what or how, up, yeah, well, how you how So solitary. what happened was is um, from there, from there they released me to the close custody unit at, back at ICC, um, which is their close custody is basically um, it's only four cells come out at a time and you get out. I think it was hour and a half or two hours. I can't remember a day you get out of your cell. And so you're and you're around three other cells. So there's eight of you all together. You have day room time. You have yard time to play basketball and stuff like that. And so, but I remember telling everybody, I'm going to go try to do my program. Because in Idaho, when you get sentenced, they always, they always, like when you get in the prison system, they like type in all your information of all your stuff you've been in trouble for, and they give you a pathway. And my pathway was pathway five, I believe it was, but it was the therapeutic community, the TC program. Okay. And so the only way I had a chance to get out before 2024 was to do that program. Wow. And so um, I said, I'm gonna go try to do my program. And everybody laughed at me, like all the homies in there, they were laughing and like, they're not letting you in a dorm. And so, but to this day, it's so crazy because how God was working and orchestrating everything before I even have a thought of surrendering to him. Because the way the interview went is I talked to our unit manager, the one who ran the unit. And I said, hey, I want to go try to do my program. He goes, well, if they'll come interview you, I'll go to bat for you. Like, he'll speak on my behalf. So I wrote, I wrote the, the you have this, it's basically a concern form. You fill it out. And I wrote to the program. It says, look it, my parole board's coming up. I want to be able to do this program. And because that program was almost a guaranteed date to get out, mm. you know. And so, um, and I say almost because there is that slight chance they do deny people. And so, uh they came to interview me and we get in this room and this is how the, this is the like one of the craziest interviews I've ever experienced and got accepted to go. It's the only time I've got accepted to do a program actually. But um, he says, promise me if I let you out there, you're not going to go stab one of those guys. Mm. And I go, I just want a chance to go home like everybody else. Mm. That was it. And so when I got to the unit I was going to, there was a man in there that had been, you know, that he had been locked up for 18 years he got locked up when he was 17 and he was 35 it might have been a little about 17 and a half at that roughly, time but roughly somewhere in there and so um i had i was told to give him one simple message do good and go home 
And so, um, and so, um, I won't use his nickname, but, um, I went up to him and said, Hey, I'm so-and-so. And and, you know, this is the message I was told to give you. He goes, I don't go by that no more. My name's Steven. And, um, very next day or no. And then he told me, I wouldn't use your name either. And so use your real name. He basically told me because of the program setting. And so the very next day I see him hosting a Bible study in the day room. There's 112 men in this dorm. And he's just hosting a Bible study, like at the table we're sitting at now, no different. And it kind of blew me away because of all the stories I had heard about him, you know, of all the things he had done in the past. And so what ended up happening was a few more days passed by, and um, I, I got into that tier on July 10th, and it was July 20th. He's doing the same thing. He's doing his Bible study. And a little voice in my head it just said, the time is now to serve me. Wow. I didn't understand it, but I listened. And I just walked up to him and I said, hey, how can I join your Bible study? And I surrendered my life to Jesus. <laughs> and I said, how do I get a Bible? And I immediately walked up to um, one of the, the, the little homie that was from California. And I said, hey, you know what? I gave my life to Jesus. I'm done with this life. If you accept it, you accept it. If not, I don't care. And I never looked back since that day. That's amazing. On July 20, 2013. Wow. And everybody has their own way of finding Jesus. Mine was weird. It was different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but I truly believe it was all part of God's plan. Yeah. Because if it would have been like just a normal guy coming in that didn't know nothing about that life, I wouldn't have gave, listened. If it would have been some young kid that was like just not, you know, but because I knew the history of this man, the how 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 lost he once was. Yeah. That's I believe that's why I just God used that man to bring me to salvation. Yeah. And there's a whole nother thing of, of the man that brought him to, to know Jesus. It's, it's, it's a ripple effect. Yeah. You so, know? so dude, you, you're saved and you're following Jesus. And how long were you in prison as a, as a believer? Uh, it was July 20th, 2013. And I got out on June 11th, 2014. So like 11 months. And then when did we meet? Uh, we met, um, shortly, I want to say towards the end of 2014, somewhere in there. So you were baby Christian. Yes. You were just coming around yes. and. Yes. And see, um, all I knew is this. I knew that why I was in there, you know, but I have to share one little story what happened in there. Cause that's what Amy knew. I can trust God with my life. Okay. So about a week into serving God, I remember we're, we were going through Genesis. We were going through Genesis. And I remember asking my friend, Steven, I says, man, what if we're disrespected in that way now that we're serving Jesus and like the fighting words? Yeah. And he's like, I don't know. It's never happened to me. Well, that day I was told to be on Expo One, which is almost like you're a police officer on the tier. Okay. So if people aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing, you say, mm-hmm. for example, I'd be like, Tuck, I'm pulling you up for not being in the day room. Okay. Well, that happened. I pulled someone up and his response was, let's fight. Okay. And I remember it was different because I had this peace and God was telling me, don't say nothing because he was just going on and on, like just just talking and talking, making a big old scene, saying that we could do this right now. We could both go to Max. And But I had this peace inside of me and God kept telling me, just stare in his face and don't say anything. Just stare him in the eye. Wow. So I was staring this man in the eye and not saying anything. And then all of a sudden, even more peace came upon me and it said, turn around and walk away. And I turned around and walked away. And that was the hardest battle I ever fought in my life because for three days straight, I had the enemy, like remember the cartoon with the little devil and the little yep. angel? Well, I had Satan in this ear telling me to go make a knife and stab the guy. Mm-hmm. And then I had God telling me how proud he was of me. And then I had other people telling me how they, proud they were of me. But I also had other people looking at me a little differently. Like you were weak maybe. Yes. But the, the one guy that was the, the, the one that was one of my the, my, the little homie, he basically came up to me and it, he kind of came up to me and he shook his head like this. Then he got this big smile and he gave me the biggest hug and he said, big homie, I know you're serious about following Jesus because I know what you would have done to that guy otherwise. And he goes, and I'll never let nobody slander your name. And, um, and you know, and that's when I asked him, well, what about you? He's like, I'm not there yet. And I was asking him, what about him following Jesus? Yeah. And he says, I'm not there yet. Well, um, he ended up getting out two weeks before me. He ended up picking up another case for like, I think a 15 year sentence in the federal prison. And the first thing he asked for 
was a Bible. Wow. You know? And so um, so that was pretty cool. Wow. You got out of prison. They grant you parole, and uh, they give you a 10-year parole. Yeah. And you hit the ground running. You you'd never look back. You went from, you know, the, the, if I met you, I met you in 2014, and you were like a evangelist immediately. You started telling everybody. And so tell me a little bit about your journey in these last 10 years while you've been on parole. Okay, so before I was released, God spoke to me, and I didn't know what an evangelist was. I didn't know what any of that was. Mm-hmm. I just know he told me, I want you to go back into the streets where I pulled you out of, and I want you to share me with you know and so when i got out of prison i told my mom and uh and so my mom was like my biggest support back then so she helped me make 50 lunches and then since um i paroled to um a christian halfway house and so i had access to the books of john pastor joseph used to give me cases of the book of john the, the from i think it's living water the book of john and so i would put one of those in every lunch and I would go down there and I would bless them with sack lunches and share Jesus with them. And they all had a surprise in every sack lunch, the book of John, the gospel message. Did you say they, is it, you're going to the homeless? Yes, the okay. homeless. And so, um, and that, that was, that was before they remodeled road skate park. That was yeah. when they were still all under the bridge Yeah. and before. And so that's when that journey started. And, and, um, so that journey has been happening since I was released the homeless ministry. But I remember a lot of people would always call me evangelist Chris and I'd be like, no, I'm not. I'm just doing what God told me to do. <laughs> and then as I got more knowledgeable in the Bible, I go, wait a minute, <laughs> I guess that's what is true. <laughs> I'm an evangelist. Yeah. Um, and how, and so, um, be, and how I even, how I even came to Calvary is why I was still in prison. We were doing, we would pray every night. We would get, we would pray every night before. We went to bed before, before like count time, the yeah. final count, we would all pray. And so what happened was, is we wanted to sing songs too, but we didn't really know songs. Yeah. So I wrote to Calvary cause I used to watch pastor Bob on TV, channel on TV. 12. Shout out to uh, Matt Halverson for working so hard to get that TV program on the air so that prisoners could watch it. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> That's yeah. Matt Halverson. Everybody. Yeah. I didn't even know that was yeah. because of that. Yeah. And so, <laughs> and so that was my church every Sunday, wow. every Sunday that was my church. And so what happened was, is, um, that, uh, that's how I came here. But the first time I ever walked in here, I walked through those doors and I was terrified Mm -hmm. because it was so many people. Yep. And I remember turning around and walking back out. I'm not going in there. And, um, uh, um, one of my dear friends that I had the honor to do her funeral, um, sister Shannon, Yep. she happened to become walking around the corner and she met me right there and not knowing she was involved with Words of Freedom at the time, not volu- knowing she was doing prison ministry, she <laughs> spotted me right off the bat. Dude, explain to people who don't know who Shannon was, um, how old was Shannon when you met her? In her 70s. <laughs> she was she was a little yeah. frail and she looked, you know, she just had that real grandma kind of look yeah. to her. And I remember seeing Shannon and Chris that, you know, you got the cool look, the prisoner yeah. tattoos and Shannon became your, she became your first friend. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she amazing. was. And, um, and so, uh, and she basically just told me, you want to sit with me? You need a Bible. And I just so happened to didn't have a Bible because I had came straight from the mall here yeah. and, um, to this, to the Saturday evening service. And so, um, and so, and at that time, my first few months, my first I think it was my first five or six months out. I came Saturday night service here, but I also went to another church mm-hmm. on Sundays Yep. because I met somebody from there because I paroled with a broken thumb. I had to go to the emergency room mm-hmm. and I met somebody there that told me about a church. And so I went in there Started on helping. Sunday yep. and then I started going to Words of Freedom on Thursday mm-hmm. and immediately got involved with praying for people. Mm-hmm. And then I started going to the D helping you on yeah, Sundays, the district coffee house. And so really, um, and, and so, yeah, I was helping at the post college, helping yeah. words of freedom, um, doing the evangelizing and then doing the, um, sets. And then I would say in the beginning of 2015, that was when I stopped going to Sunday services over there. And then I basically kind of got more full, more involved here. And and so for the past, I guess that would make it mm. nine years. Yeah. You have been without ever, you know, even thinking about how immediate your, um, just your radical transformation in Jesus is in prison and you get out, you hit the streets running and you have never slowed down in these last, I guess, 10 years now. You have served the streets. You got back into the prisons, evangelized. 
you, as I said in the beginning, all these things that you serve in and your excitement from the day that I met you till now has never changed. You have been such a faithful servant of Jesus. And, um, dude, I am just, I just think of those guys who were telling you how proud they were of you when you turned away and you listened Mm -hmm. to the Holy Spirit say, walk away and be peaceful. Um, I am so honored and to know you and just proud of, of you as a brother in Christ. And, um, so that is amazing. And I'll just share a little bit of now, since I've, you know, overlapped with you these last 10 years, every couple of years, I would sign a little paper to the parole board and say, Hey, this guy's amazing, please. And you would, you know, put the paperwork in and ask if you could get off parole. And they'd always say no, <laughs> no, but there was a purpose for that. Yeah. Because, you know, okay, so a lot of people were in an uproar that they wouldn't let me off. Yeah. And, but I always would tell them that's okay because technically they're not in control of my life. Yeah. God is. Yes. And God has a reason for it. I just don't know what that reason is yet. Yep. But he revealed that reason to me in September. Mm. Because you see, I finally, after getting denied more than one time, I finally got approved to go back into the prison to do Bible studies. And then COVID happened. So then everything was locked down. Mm. And so then this September, I finally got to take words of freedom back out into the prisons. Mm. And what ended up happening was, is it's a testimony to what God can do because I'm still on parole, but I'm able to walk back in there and do a Bible study. And so you're glad you're on parole. So the, the everyone knows that it's God's doing. Yes. That's it's not awesome. my doing. If it's my doing, I would be in there with them. Yes. That's awesome. And you know? so you're in there saying, I'm a parolee in here preaching the gospel to you. Yes. That's cool. And um, and the cool part about it is a couple times, because I'm encouraging the men, go back to your tears, invite people to come. Basically, go back and invite, invite them. And they're inviting people, and then they're coming. They're like, whoa, wow. we remember you from all those years ago. Wow. And so it's pretty awesome. And not only... And, and God has been growing, even growing the prison ministry, because now... um. We all we actually have volunteers in multiple facilities right now awesome. doing words of freedom. Awesome. And the the goal behind it is to so when they are released, they can come to the words of freedom service here on Thursdays and they don't miss a beat. That's they, they, that's what they're used to and, and yeah. they're they're just jumping right in where they were in yeah. prison. Now they're on this side and, and hanging yeah. out and that's awesome. Um I'm going to, once again, if if, uh, if you're available, if you're in Boise and you can come April 15th, Calvary Boise, we're going to, we are going to have a grand celebration for your faithfulness in these 10 years of serving Jesus while you were on parole. And um, now we get to celebrate your amazing next chapter of where will God send you beyond, you know, the borders of Idaho and internationally. Uh, so really excited. April 15th, we're going to do that. Excited for uh, you to have a time with our church family where we can all celebrate you. Um, I thought it might be nice because every time I hear your story, I'm like, man, I hope somebody is listening or I hope that you um, that someone can hear your story that just needed to hear it because it's it, it's a story that God can take someone that was literally in solitary confinement and bring them into the light. So um, look right here and in one minute, one minute, the one minute gospel okay. presentation. Anybody who's listening that um, that could maybe relate to this story, what would you tell them about uh, about God? The, the truth is this. A lot of times when we're hurt and we're broken, we want to blame God. But see, God's not the one to blame. We live in a broken world. We b- live in a world that basically belongs to Satan. But you see... God loved us so much, like it says in John three sixteen. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. It says that in the second part of verse 17. So if that's you and you're struggling with addiction, you're struggling with hurt, pain, abuse, trauma, that I would encourage you to, to give Jesus a try wholeheartedly for six months. You know, all in, reading your Bible every day, talking to him, praying to him, and your life will never be the same. Amen. Dude, I love this man. I love that you are the you're the gospel on the ground evangelist to our city, and I am so excited to 
How many how many more days and and I got ten more days. No, wait, let me think. Today's the fourth. Yeah, ten days in a wake up. Ten days in a wake up, even using prison terms. Ten days <laughs> in a wake up and you are officially yeah. off parole. Come celebrate with us yeah. if you can. Congratulations, brother. Love you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Love you too, Chuck. All right, man.